It's an honor to be with you all here today and to talk with you. You heard two great presenters that have come and brought you information. What my job is and what I would kind of try and hit on is try and get, how do we take that knowledge and how do we make it into uh, our classroom? How do we get that in there? Um, in the 3C model, they talked about character and they talked about that word consistency. And that's the thing that's really hard to get into uh, the classroom is how do you consistently teach about character? My wife's a teacher. Um, I get, she comes home and guess what happened today? I get those every day. She teaches in an inner city school in Wichita and, um, and every day. Uh, there's a, actually one, one day she came home and she had a student that got mad at her. They'd gone through several different things and so they, they go through this process where they correct and they, remove, they move the child and then they remove the child and they go through this whole process. Well, she had finally got to that point where they were removing the child and went through this argument uh, you know, with the child uh, to get them out. And as the child's leaving the door, the child walks out of the door and then sticks their head back in the door and says, I don't think you realize how much I hate you, and left and left. So it's become the joke around our house um, that when, things, uh, when she's telling me stories about her kids, I just look at her and I say, honey, I just really don't think you realize how much they hate you. <laughs> and, but you can see for teachers, a lot of times we just keep getting beat down and beat down and beat down and beat down every day. And then you come to something like this and we're saying, hey, you need to be teaching these kids character. And you're thinking, oh, great, one more thing to teach. Thanks. Glad I came. But there is a way. There is a means. I love going into classrooms. I go into classrooms all the time. I work with museums um, and generally I go into classrooms when I'm doing leadership training or I'm doing uh, work for a museum. When we're doing work for museums we actually take artifacts into the classroom and everything we do we teach history but we utilize history to teach character. And so just this past week I was in a school in uh, Wichita and I was talking with them about the early oil history. I, I also work at the Kansas Oil Museum and I was talking with them about the early history of uh, oil wells in Kansas. Kansas had a big oil boom around 1915s when it started, went through the 1930s and um, during that time that's when the oil industry really came into the modern age. It's when it really developed. Then it kind of the boom went to Oklahoma, then it went to Texas, and it began to spread all across the country, but it started really in Kansas. And so one of the things that we talked with them about, and I'm not going to go through the whole history, so just I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of that, is we talked with them about how um, when the oil industry would come in, there was a whole series of things that had to happen, and there were multiple teams that had to work together in a unit to be able to accomplish a goal. One of those teams that had to come in was uh, the Derrick building team. And you would have a team of about 10 men that would come in and they would build a 100 foot tall derrick in six days. Erect it and they would begin drilling, then to where the drillers could come in and begin drilling. So we went through this. I brought in a derrick and showed them how to make it. Make it. Then we did an activity where we gave them straws and paper clips and tape and they had to build their own derrick and see how much weight it could hold up. And we all did this in one classroom. But the reason that we did that is because we were able to talk about a derrick. And we were able to talk about a derrick has a strong foundation, then it has strong uprights that are tied together, and then it has crossbars, and then it has the diagonals. We went through each step of that and how they built that derrick to be able to, uh, to, be able to drill, begin drilling for oil. And for a derrick to be quality derrick, for it to really be a, something that is worthwhile, that derrick has to have this word, integrity. The derrick has to have integrity to be able to stand. Now, when we talk about integrity, here's the problem with that word. When you're talking about integrity, most people have a different definition of integrity. If I were to go around this room and ask, each, ask you to define integrity, let's just do it. Someone define integrity. What is integrity? We've talked about it all morning long. It's every speaker has talked about it, but what is integrity? Difference between right and wrong. Even when no one's looking. Saying what you mean, mean what you say. Saying what you mean, mean what you say. Uh, ability to stand up under stress. Ability to stand up under stress. Honesty. Honesty. Right there, we got six different definitions of the same word. And they're all different. They're all slightly different. And in fact, most people define integrity in a very unique way. If someone has been dishonest to you, then generally you define integrity as honest. If someone has been disloyal to you, then you define integrity as being loyal. 
generally we define integrity by what has been done to us and someone who doesn't do that to us, they're the person that has integrity. I want to give you a definition of integrity because it's one number, number one thing that people say they're looking for in their employees. It's the number one thing that their people are saying they're looking for in their bosses. And if it's the number one thing that people are say they're looking for, it means that it's not there in a very large majority of these situations. So what is this word, this ominous word, integrity? I want to take you back to junior high math class. Aren't you excited? In junior high math class, you learned this word, integer. Does anyone remember that word? What is an integer? Any whole number. Any whole number. An integer is any whole number. Now listen to the words. Integer, integrity. They're the same root. Literally, integrity is the state of being an integer. That's what integrity is. Integrity is the state of being an integer. A state of being a whole number. So, that's why we use integrity to talk about a tower. A tower has integrity when it's whole, when it's complete, when all the parts are there. The space shuttle has integrity if all the pieces are in place. It can go into space. If one piece is out of place, it can't go into space because it no longer has integrity. It means having everything. So, when we talk to the students about this, when we begin talking about history, and we talk about building derricks, then I start asking them, you've heard a lot about character, right? What are some of the character qualities that you, that you think are important? What are some character qualities? That's an open question. What are some character qualities? Huh? Honesty. Honesty. What's another one? Kindness. Kindness. Compassion. Compassion. Humility. Humility. Perseverance. Perseverance. And we can go on and on and on. I did this with a class and I went through and I put a word by every single board that was on this derrick. And I said basically what integrity is, it's that state of being whole, it's that state of being complete. Someone who has integrity is someone who exhibits all of these character qualities. When they have all of those character qualities, they are a whole person. They are someone that has integrity. Another way of looking at it is when you see me up here speaking today, and then if you come to Kansas and you see me at the Kansas Oil Museum, or if you go and you see me hanging out with my friends, or if you go to the game that I'm going to go to at Oklahoma Christian University here in just a minute and see me yelling at the referees, and, and if you go to any one of those situations, do you see the same person in every situation, or do you see someone who changes? Someone with integrity is the same in every single situation. Why? Because these qualities are the same in them. Someone who changes from place to place to place as they're going through life, like most of our kids do, like most of our adults do, like our culture encourages us to do, they lose integrity because they become someone different. They become someone that you really don't know who you're going to get. So, this is one way that we bring character into the classroom, utilizing something that has really nothing to do with character. So, how do we do that on a regular basis? How do we do that on a daily basis? Lynn did a great job when she was talking about how you have to, you can't wait till the kid gets in trouble. You have to be able to acknowledge that before they get in trouble. But how do we do that on a consistent basis? I want to start with this. Someone tell me, what is the most boring thing that you teach? Teachers that are near, what's the most boring subject, or the most boring not overall subject, but lesson. What's the most boring lesson you teach? Grammar. Grammar. Okay, someone give me another one. I don't even know how to spell grammar. That's how bad that is. Okay, someone give me another one. Economics. Economics. <laughs> one more. Classifications, Classifications of, of huh? Of living Classifications of living things. Okay, we'll come back to those in a minute. We'll see if we can take what we're doing and apply that to those things. Now, the reason, that we, the reason that it's so hard to work that into our lessons on a regular basis and on an ongoing basis generally is because we really have a hard time of, of keeping it at the forefront of our mind. Why? Because if you're like my wife, she spends all night the night before thinking about what is she going to teach. 
And then how is she going to teach that? And getting the materials ready for what she's going to teach and how she's going to teach it. So how do we go from this culture that we live in right now, where character, we all agree, I think, is lacking in many of our students. How do we go from a culture where character is lacking in our classroom settings to a a, a community where character is at the forefront of our classrooms. How do we get from that point to this point? Most people would say, well, we need to have new ways of t integrating it. We need to have new ways of teaching it. I'm going I'm to challenge you tonight, and, or today, and I'm going to challenge you with this idea. That it's not what you're teaching that will bring character in the classroom. It's not how you're teaching that will bring character in the classroom. It's something else. There is a law that is out there. It's called the Law of the Diffusion of Innovation. Has anyone ever heard of that law? Law of Diffusion of Innovation. And basically what it states is that if you look at any type of innovative idea that comes in and permeates an entire society, it follows a certain pattern. There is a law that it follows. So, Facebook. When Facebook came on, what did they just celebrate? Their eighth or something birthday, huh? 10, 10 year birthday or whatever. So how did it go from uh, nothing 10 years ago to being in virtually every home in America today? Okay, there was a law and Facebook follows this law. And basically what it does, the law of innovation says you've got 2% of the population that will be involved in the conceptualization and the introduction of, of this innovative idea. So this was that one college where Facebook started up. Then you have a next group of people, right here, they're your enthusiasts. And your enthusiasts, they compensate for about 13%. About 13% of the overall uh, population. Then you have your early adopters, and your early adopters generally somewhere around 30% of the population. Then you have your late adopters, which again are another 30% of the uh, population. And then you have laggards, which account for the next 13, 14, 15 percent of the population. And then you have the two percent that live off the grid that are never, ever, ever going to have Facebook. Now, it follows this. And I bet you you can see this when you're looking at Facebook. Because if you're looking at Facebook, these are the people who created it. These are the other colleges that said, hey, we want that on our college too. We want that on our campus. Then these are the teenagers right here. The teenagers that said, hey, here's a way I can talk with my teens. My parents don't know it. We can communicate, we can go back and forth, and as you start going through this to the great, greater part of this population, some parents start getting involved on that, and parents get involved in it, and so it begins to permeate the society through the early adopters. Then you got the late adopters. These, when it comes to Facebook, are the grandparents. These are the grandparents who got sick and tired of their kids never sending them pictures of, the, uh, of their grandkids. And so, you, and the people who are laughing in here are probably grandparents because you experience this. And your kids start telling, if you want to see it, just get on Facebook. If you want to see pictures of them, just get on Facebook. I put everything on Facebook. And so they get on Facebook so that they can keep up with their kids. The parents got on Facebook so they could keep up with their kids. And it begins to go through and permeate the society. And then you got the laggards. Now, these are the grandfathers back here that for years, uh, the grandma would sit there and look at the picture and then the granddad would be, let me see that. Well, here. And finally, Grandma got tired of that. And Grandma looked at Grandpa and said, if you want to see the picture, you get on Facebook. I'm not doing that anymore. And so then the grandpas get on. And then there's the 2% over here that will never be on it. So this is the law of innovation of how an innovative idea permeates a society, how it goes into society. This applies to how do we get character into the classroom to begin to transform that culture. There's a guy by the name of Simon Sinek. And Simon Sinek actually came up with the rule of the golden circle. And in the rule of the golden circle, he basically found that most companies, most innovative ideas, die because they can't get from here to here. Mom and pop stores die because they can't get from the small niche market that they're in to reaching the more general audience. Uh, innovative ideas die because they can't get across that bridge right there. And he found that there was a common theme among all of the innovations that were able to get past this mark and go ahead and permeate the society. They all had something in common. And he, we called it was the golden circle. And it's a very different way of looking at business. It's a very different way of looking at ideas and how do you spread innovation. And basically he's, what he said is that there's three 
circles that really get you to the core of where you want to be. The first one is what? And this is where most people begin. Most people begin, most teachers begin with, what am I going to teach this year? In fact, I guarantee you, if you're in, like most states, your standards are changing in uh, very radical ways in some, t in some instances. And so the very first thing you do when you begin preparing for your year is you go get the standards to see what am I going to have to teach this year. You see, it's the way that we're geared. So we start with what? What am I going to teach? Then it comes to the second question, and it's how am I going to teach it? How am I going to teach that? And most businesses, most people who approach their job, they work in this way, going from the outside in, and they rarely ever get beyond the how. They rarely ever get beyond the how. And that's why they're never able to permeate the whole society. What he found in innovative ideas that were able to permeate the entire society to get beyond the how, the, to really become an integral part of changing the culture, they asked this question. Why? But they didn't just ask that question, they started with that question. And they worked from that question out. This is what it takes to bring character in the classroom. This is what it takes. You can't do it by starting with your lesson plan and saying, what am I going to teach and how am I going to teach it? You have to start with why. You are involved in some way in education. Okay? And if you're involved in education, I want to know, why are you involved in education? No, really, why? No. Why are you involved in education? Make a mark on the future. What else? Learning is everything. What? Learning is everything. Learning is everything. Uh, to create lifelong scholars. To create lifelong scholars. If some of you in here, you honestly have to say, because I needed a job. But why did you pick teaching? There's a whole bunch of jobs out there. It's because at your core, at the very beginning, somewhere there is a why that maybe you lost somewhere along the way that says, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. I want to impact someone's life. You cannot bring character into the classroom unless you bring yourself back to the why. You have to start with the why. Why am I a teacher? Now, how am I going to teach? Then, what standards must I get into my lessons? You see, we almost go all exact opposite. We start with the standards and we try and figure out a way to teach it, and then we, and then we struggle with how I never have time to talk, uh, talk about character. It is amazing to me how many teachers I go in and I talk with, and they say it all the time, I never have time to bring character lessons in. And I look at them and I say, I didn't have time to bring character lessons in, I was talking about Derek's. But we're going to tie that back in to character. We're going to bring that in. But you have to get back to the why. If you're not at the why, if you're not at that point where you're able to really bring yourself to that point to remind yourself on a daily basis, and I know it's hard when you've got a student that is storming out of the room and saying, I don't think you realize how much I hate you. It's hard to remember why. But the only way that you can change the culture in your classroom is if you're able to bring yourself to the why before you start looking at the how and then the what am I going to teach. You have to bring it back to that part. You have to bring it back to that scale. You see, we were talking about Derek's and different things over here. I didn't bring this up and start talking about Derek's because I knew I could teach this lesson. You see, this was what the teachers chose. The teacher said, we want you to come in and talk about how the derricks were built because we're doing physics right now and we're doing things like this in physics and so we kind of want to tie that into our physics lessons. So I immediately started with, why am I going to this school in the first place? Why am I going? I'm going because I believe that history is a vital part of our culture that we're supposed to learn from in order to be better in the future. It's not about people, places, and dates. It's about learning from the past so we can be better in the future. That's, what, that's why we teach history. So why am I going to teach on this lesson? And how am I going to do it? Well, I'm going to do it in a way that meets with their, with the, their curriculum. And then what am I going to actually teach? And that's when we got back to the dare. So you got to start with the why. The why that I'm in a classroom is because I want to teach kids how to have integrity. 
I want to teach them how to have compassion. I want to teach them how to have these different qualities. And that's always what's on the forefront of my mind. That is what, always what is there. <coughs> but if you're always looking at the what, you never think about this. Because you're so concerned with the what. You're going the wrong way. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Do what? That's what we're programmed to do. Every teacher's workshop that you go to is going to, be, is going to start about, okay, what do we got to teach? Now let us show you how to teach it better. Every single one. It's the way that we're programmed. And we are programmed and set up to fail. You as a teacher have the ability to come back to the why. And why am I here? Why is there a reason for me to be in this classroom today? It is to teach lives, to change lives, to impact lives. And when that's on the forefront of your mind, these types of things begin to jump off the board. So, let's take one of these over here. I am not taking grammar because I know nothing about grammar. In fact, um, I, I've, th this will kind of shock you. I've actually written five books, and the very first one that I wrote, um, my dad was so proud of me. He was extremely proud, and so he had that book that, that I'd written, and he was excited about it, and he asked me to send him a case of them, so I sent him a case of them. He got one of them. Do you know the first person he went to to give it to? He went to, huh? My high school English teacher. He took it to my high school English teacher and says, I wanted you to be the first one that got a copy of this. I thought you'd be excited to see it. Here's literally what my English teacher said. She grabbed that book, and she looked at it, and she just started laughing. And she said, huh, imagine that. Warren making a living doing the one thing he has absolutely no talent for. That's exactly what she said. That is exactly what she said. Uh, spell check is, my, is uh, everything to me. So, uh, we're not going to go there. But, let's look at e e economics. Okay? Let's look at economics. So, you're looking at economics. A boring subject. Why do we even teach economics? Why do we even teach it? where you have to vote on the people to make these economic decisions. And so if they're telling you stuff and you know from your study of economics that that is not going to work, you're not going to be likely to vote for it. You need to know at least a little bit so that you can elect the people who are going to be making these big decisions. Okay. All right. Let's take it even back. Let's make it personal. Let's go, uh, before we go political, let's make it personal. Society functions on trade. Society functions on trade. Society functions on trade, okay? Society functions on trade. What, why are we in the classroom? We're in the classroom so that people can be better, so that we can make a mark on these, these students, so that they can learn, so that they can grow. And if society functions on trade, do you think we need to make an impact in economics? Do you think we need to teach it? You see, there's all types of character issues that you can bring into this because why? It's how we function. It's how we function. In under economics, when you're talking about economics, what you're really talking about is you're talking about integrity. You can't have a society that has integrity unless you have economic integrity, unless you have honesty, unless you have those things. But most of the time, when you put the word economics up there, I've, I doubt that very many of us in this room had any inclination whatsoever to think about character. But it's all about character. The reason we don't think about it is because we're focused on the what instead of the why. Why do we teach on economics? Because we've got to have, you've got to have some functioning capability in economics to become a better person. To become a better person, you've got to understand how this economics works. It means you've got to have integrity in your economics. You've got to have some form of integrity. You see what I'm saying? You see where we're going with that? Okay, let's look at classification of living things. Okay, we're running out of time. Classification of living things. Okay, uh, you brought that up. Classification of living things. Give me some, what do you, what do you mean by that? What do you teach with that? Um, genus, species, is, that is that what you teach? Yeah, yeah, kind of. But how to put living things in certain groups where they're related. Okay, okay. So uh, you got a bear, and you got a lion, and you got a tiger, and you got to figure out how to classify these because they have things that are in common, right? Okay, what in the world does that have to do with character? What does that have to do with character qualities? Well, from what you said, it would show how um, 
nature of the human being, the species of the human being, are the top of the classification, uh, and could show how responsible we are to the other creatures. And okay, so it's maintain ecosystem and make maintain so ecosystem. You can put all yeah. Absolutely. A responsibility with the ecosystem, responsibility with teaching us. Let's make it more personal. I always like things making personal. What, what the question I always ask is, is, what does this say to you? What does this say to you as a person? What does it say to me as a person? Why in the world do we even bother classifying? Why do we, why do we put lions and tigers together? I mean, what's the purpose of that? Let me tell you what the purpose of that is. The purpose of that is, is you have a tiny little brain. That's the purpose of it. You see, as humans, we can't keep all of the knowledge in the world in our brains because our brains are too small. So what do we do? We simplify things. We put things into categories. We put things into classes so we can understand them because we can't keep all of them in our head at the same time. So it's, either, it's easier to talk about a class of animals than it is to talk about every single individual animal. So we classify them. But do you realize this? We do the same thing as people. We do the same thing as people all the time. We, 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 we have stereotypes. And why do we have stereotypes? We always teach stereotypes are bad. Stereotypes aren't bad. Bad stereotypes are bad. Good stereotypes are good. But we have stereotypes because we cannot separate all the people that are in this world. So we tend to group people together into people groups to have a somewhat understanding of them because we don't have the ability to understand all of them. So you know what that means for you students? What that means for you is, is that there's people out there that have bad character. You see, character is a neutral term. You can have good character or you can have bad character. And there are some people out there that have bad character. And there are some people out there that have good character. And let me ask you a question. What lump group do you want to be in? What lump group do you want people to talk to you about? Because here's the thing. Once they put you into that group, they really start looking at you as an individual. And whatever the other people in that group are guilty of, that's what you tend to be guilty of. You know, that's why your parents said, you need to be careful who you hang around. You see what I just did there? Wait a minute, we're talking about lions and tigers, aren't we? But why are we talking about lions and tigers? Why? Because I want these kids to be better. Here's what I'm trying to share with you. There is no secret curriculum that's going to transform the culture of character. Now, be, understand what I'm saying very carefully here. Character First has a phenomenal curriculum. Strata has a phenomenal, Strata now, isn't it? Strata has a phenomenal C3 curriculum, which you should definitely take advantage of to get it into the classroom. But to change the culture in your classroom, to change the conversation, a curriculum can't do it alone. A curriculum has to have a teacher that remembers why. Because if you can have a curriculum there, but you don't remember the why, you're not starting with the why. There's too many what's that will consume your time that you'll never get to that curriculum effectively changing the society. Does that make sense? You have to start with the why, then you look at how and the what, and that's when you begin to change the culture. That's when you begin to change the culture. You see, people like Lynn and people like myself, we have a, a dynamic advantage. Why? Because I stand up in front of groups like this and talk all the time. This is on my mind every single day. It's what I do. Okay? The only way we can change the culture is when every teacher says, this is what I do. I change kids' lives. I happen to be talking about math today, but I change kids' lives. My father-in-law sells insurance. He's one of the most successful insurance salesmen in the world. I mean, he's phenomenal. He has 400 plus offices across the United States and Spain, Mexico. I mean, he's unbelievable. He has this phrase that he uses all the time. He doesn't go to the grocery store. He doesn't go to the bank. He doesn't go to the games. He doesn't go to any of those things. What he does is, is I, went, uh, I was in the grocery store recruiting some kids, and while I was there, or recruiting some new people, but while I was there, I happened to pick up some uh, peanut butter. He talks about it in a different way. I w went to the game to recruit some new prospects for my business, and while I was there, I decided to watch the game. And that's the phrase he uses all the time. He uses it in everything that he does. I, 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 went, uh, I was, went on vacation to try and find some new people in a new region to recruit, and while I was there, uh, I decided to take a cruise. And so whatever he, that what he's doing, 
is always secondary to why He exists. He exists because He wants every single person in this world to have life insurance to protect the, their family if something catastrophic happens. He is very passionate about it. And because His why is always first, He's very successful at it. The same thing happens in our job. The same thing happens in our positions and all and those things. When we start with the why and then work to the what, we are able to transform a culture. Why? Because the law of innovation says that's the way it works. It starts with you. Then you, comp then you add into that a curriculum. You add into that specifics of that curriculum, but it starts with remembering the why. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Last thing I want to share with you. Because uh, I want to make sure we leave on a, a, a note. And my favorite thing to do is make sure teachers know that they don't know everything. So um, I want to play a game with you. I want to play a game with you. And uh, this will be the last thing that we do. And I want you to join in. You remember when you were a kid and you played the opposite game? Remember that? So if someone would say up, you'd say down. down. Okay, that's about 30%. This is an all play. Okay? I want everybody playing. We're going to play the opposite game. Here we go. Ready? Up. In, out. right, Left. black, White. success, Failure. wrong, right. no, 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 I'm just telling you you're wrong. <laughs> the opposite of success is not, nor has it ever been failure. That is a lie. You know what the number one fear of people in the world is? That's number one. You know what number two is? Death. Nope. Fear of failure. Fear of failure. In fact, we have kids all the time that will go through and they'll answer, number, they'll answer a question number one, number two, number three, they hit number four, they don't know how to do number four, they just completely stop and they don't do any of the rest of the paper. Why? Because we've so conditioned our kids that they're so afraid of failure that once they fail at something, they stop, they quit, they give up. Here's the definition of failure. Here's the definition of failure. The definition of failure is not... Is not I, 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 let me change that. Let me give you the opposite of success. The opposite of success is not failure, is what I'm trying to say. The opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is when you settle. It's when you quit. As long as you're failing, you're making progress. Have you ever thought about how many times, um, uh, how, how many times Thomas Edison failed to create a light bulb before he created a light bulb? Have you ever thought about how many times uh, Abraham Lincoln failed to get elected? Uh, for political office before he's elected President of the United States? Have you ever thought about how many times Donald Trump has failed? Have you seen his hair? Every day. <laughs> Yet he's still one of the most influential businessmen in America. The opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is when you quit. It's when you settle. As long as you're failing, you're moving forward. You cannot fail unless you try. The opposite of success is when you quit. I just want to encourage you as a teacher. Changing the culture, changing the culture in your classroom is a possibility. You will have failures along the way. You'll have things that won't work. But the only time that you've done the opposite of succeeding at changing your culture is if you quit and you stop trying. Never stop trying.